Um, we'll just start off with the classification of skin conditions in pregnancy. So we, so we have physiological changes of pregnancy as is uh, per textbook, and then those are conditions that are pre-existing or coexisting, coexisting within pregnancy, and then we have those dermatoses that are specific to pregnancy. So just an overview of what the talk is about, basically what I've said, plus a few extra. So we'll look at nevirapine-associated rash and then um, something on skin bleaching as well. So physiological changes, um, not going to say much on that, but we get, we all know, stria gravidarum. Um, linea nigra becomes more prominent in pregnancy. Melasma, those um, brown spots that you get on the face, discoloration, and then palmar erythe erythema, hair loss, postpartum hair loss, and just another picture of what um, melasma looks like. So pre-existing conditions, we're also not going to go too much into details with that. We're going to look at two common conditions, which is basically eczema and psoriasis. So eczema is most common um, dermatosis associated with pregnancy. Um, it often improves in pregnancy, although some said it gets worse in pregnancy as well. Um, usually it's positive, pre presents in people that have a positive history of atopy, and the treatment is topical emulants and low-dose topical um, corticosteroids. So psoriasis, um, it may improve in pregnancy, it may stay the same or it may get worse. Um, it can also present for the first time in pregnancy. The treatment is uh, Ditranol, we can use and call TAR, but um, Metatrex, so it can be used, but unfortunately in pregnancy it's contraindicated. Uh, just going back there. Then, um, sorry. So those conditions that are specific to pregnancy or dermatosis of pregnancy. Unfortunately, there's a bit of a debate within the classification, but according to up-to-date 2017, this is the classification that we're supposed to follow. So it's polymorphic eruptions of pregnancy, which is also known as sporadic decorated plaques and papules of pregnancy. Then pemphigoid gestationis. There's quite a lot of names that are being used, but these are the most common ones. Or herpes gestationis, um, atopic eruptions of pregnancy, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, as well as pustula psoriasis of pregnancy. So polymorphic eruption of pregnancy, or pup, pup, like most of us call it. Uh, <laughs> it's a B9 self-limiting pruritic disorder. Incident is one up to 300. Usually late onset and immediate postpartum. Uh, Primigravidas, um, multiple pregnancy, as well as excessive weight gain, is uh, they're more at risk. That has to do basically with the stretching of the stomach. It's, it, eruptions are usually um, edematous, plaques and papules, and the color can vary from pink to red, red brown. The distribution is usually around the stria, and you can see there's a nice picture there where this is pairing of the umbilical artery. So I think if you have to remember it for the exam, poop, pup, sparing of the umbilical artery. Ugh, sorry, umbilical area. So there's no umbilical involvement or periumbilical involvement. So um, it resolves spontaneously within four to six weeks postpartum. There are no risk to the fetus, and there's no risk of recurrence in subsequent pregnancies. The treatment is usually symptomatic. You have to reassure your parent, your patient, I can use methanol in aqueous cream, topical corticosteroids, antihistamine, as well as um, oral corticosteroids in severe cases. So just how it looks again, I can see the umbilicus is not involved and it's along the stria. Then the second one, pemphigoid gestationis. It's a race of limiting autoimmune bullous disease which is usually due to circulating antibodies against the bullous pemphigoid antigen, 180. It presents within the hemidesmosome of the basement membrane zone. And the incident is one in up to 50,000. Uh, usually uh, late onset and immediate postpartum. Eruptions are pruritic vesicular um, bullous edematous uticarated plagues. The distribution, it usually begins um, in the abdomen, including the umbilicals and periumbilical area, and then it spreads to the trunk, extremities involving the soles and the feet. So the risk to the fetus, I think this one is important for us because there are risks to the fetus. The fetus is at risk for small for gestational age in up to 10% of the pregnancy's prematurity, and also some skin involvement with the infant in up to 10% of the cases. 
So it may recur in subsequent pregnancy and with earlier onset and more severe disease. Um, it may recur also with oral contraceptive use as well as with menses. It may flare at, times of the, at the time of delivery. Diagnosis, you have to diagnose it on skin biopsy with its specific specifications. Also, you can do serum um, levels of anti um, bullous pemphigoid 180 antibodies. So the treatment, topical corticosteroids, antihistamines, you can use um, systemic corticosteroids in severe cases as well. So in comparison to the pup pup, you can see here there's umbilicus is involved um, and the, the eruptions are more bulli than um, the previous one. So topic eruptions of pregnancy, it's a pruritic disorder uh, of pregnancy that presents as an examitous or popular eruptions in patients with an atopic background. Incidence is more common um, than the other two. It's one in up to 300. Um, much more earlier onset, so in first trimester, second trimester, whereas the other two are more late onset. Um, eruptions are usually pruritic papules and examitous plagues. Distribution affects the face, the neck, the collet, flexures, of the arm and the legs, and the skin is usually severely dry. So resolutions, usually the eruption clear within two weeks postpartum. There are no fetal affectation, but the fetus is at risk of developing um, skin, atopic skin diseases in infancy. It may recur in subsequent pregnancies. The treatment, emolens, antihistamines, and topical corticosteroids. So that's basically what it looks like. I think most of us have probably seen something like this, but we just couldn't pinpoint it. So the next one, intrahepatic um, cholestasis of pregnancy. Um, this is basically, some says it's more of a liver disease and doesn't qualify to be classified under dermatosis, but it is in many of the literatures classified under. It only presents with pruritus, doesn't have a primary um, skin changes, um, and usually, um, it's characterized by severe pruritus and an increase in bile salts and liver enzymes. Itching usually of the palms and the soles, and it's more nocturnal. Inci incidence is, is one in up to 100 uh, of pregnancies. This is quite common, so I did actually double check just to make sure. Um, are we just missing the cases or are we not seeing them? So probably we're not really diagnosing them enough. So onset, more late onset, um, and it's related to the peak of estrogen levels and genetic predisposition. Cutaneous lesions, they are nonspecific and they are usually secondary to scratching. They vary from excoriations of um, prurigo nodularis, and sometimes jaundice may occur very rarely. So there are risks to the fetus. So the fetus is at risk of fetal distress, prematurity, and intrauterine fetal distress. So maternal risks, hemorrhage due to the vitamin K deficiency, and then um, hepatobiliary cancer has been reported um, to be more common, two times more common in women with ICP than in those without. So it may recur in subsequent pregnancies with much earlier onset and much severe disease, and it may also recur with the use of oral contraceptive use. So the only definitive treatment is delivery of the fetus, you can use um, urodeoxyhaline acid, um, calamine lotion, and sedative antihistamine, just for them to sleep better at night. So these are just uh, the kind of um, eruptions that you can get. They are very nonspecific, starting from just um, scratching, um, nodule, um, molds, excoriations there. Uh, picture C and D is actually basically the same patient that had superimposed bacterial infection, but this is after four weeks of treatment with um, urodeoxyhaline acid. So pustular psoriasis of pregnancy, also a lot of debate around this one, whether it should be included in the classification or not. Some people feel it's more um, a pre-existing condition that only gets um, aggravated by pregnancy, basically. So this is an exceedingly rare variant, and I think also because of the rarity. Um, it's a rare variant of generalized pustular psoriasis occurring or triggered by pregnancy. It's usually late onset and immediate postpartum. Eruptions are erythematous plaques started at the periphery with sterile pustules in a circular pattern. 
Plaques enlarge from the periphery as the center becomes eroded and crushed. So the distribution, it usually begins in the flutural areas and spreads centrifugally. It involves the trunks and, ex and extremities. The feet and the hands are usually spared. Um, oral and esophageal erosions may occur, and usually there's no pruritus. So um, uh, the symptoms, symptomatic, the systemic symptoms are very severe, so they range from malaise, fever, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, tetany, with metabolic imbalances. So um, the fit, um, fetal risk to the fetus, fetus is at risk of, plus, uh, there is risk of placental insufficiency, miscarriage, as well as more for gestational age. The eruption usually resolves immediately um, the postpartum, but they may flare at delivery. So treatment is symptomatic, correct your metabolic imbalances, systemic cortico -cortic um, corticosteroids. Usually we start with high doses and then you temper it down slowly. So um, just a picture of what it may look like. So um, just something out of the topic a bit. Um, I think Navirapin um, in the early 2000, especially around 2004, 2005, we've seen quite a lot of Stevenson Johnson or rashes that are associated with Navirapin use, mostly because um, Navirapin was part of our first line treatment. It was in the combination for first line treatment and we've seen quite a lot of that. So this is a patient with um, Stevenson Johnson syndrome um, some of the, so that's what basically, it started off with the wet um, eruptions and usually they become very dry and um, it's quite a severe condition. On the um, right, just um, non-specific um, acne that you can easily mistaken for a topic eruption of pregnancy, but if you know the distribution weights, mostly distributions, you can easily differentiate between the two. So since we've changed the, um, since because of all the complications of nevirapin, I think that's when we decided to change the first line to from nevirapin to ephedrine, and we've seen less and less of these cases. Also, um, if we start a patient, we're still using nevirapin because evidence has shown that if we start a patient that is already virally suppressed um, on nevirapin, they are very, uh, the risk of developing skin condition or um, side effects from the nevirapin is much, much less. So another topic that I thought was quite interesting, something that's quite common, I don't know if much of us are aware of it, skin bleaching. So according to the WHO, out of every 10 women in Nigeria, eight of them are actually using skin bleaching products. So um, why are they using it? They believe that the fairer skin you have, the more it's associated with the beauty, you are more um, likely to get married and it's associated with wealth. Um, it's not only in, in Nigeria or in other African countries, although that's where it's more popular, but it's also in Asian countries, especially in Thailand. Um, and it's not only amongst women, but up to 30% of men are also using skin bleaching products. You can see a nice picture there from 2008 up to 2009, change of color. Um, it's also very popular among us celebrities, um, yeah. So it's, it's something that we actually need to think about and just think about actually what are the side effects of skin bleaching. So it's associated with, um, the problem with skin bleaching actually is because the content of what they contain, most of them contain mercury products, um, hydroquinine, um, high doses of steroids, potent steroids, and those are all, um, if they're not using the right dosages, can be quite um, harmful to, to, to the skin. So this is a patient with skin cancer, um, all from skin bleaching, chronic use of skin bleaching. Um, I actually have a, had a patient um, with that in the ward. Um, I'm sure if I wasn't reading up on skin bleaching, I wouldn't have known. So I approached her and I just inquired a bit and she actually did say that yes, she's been using it for quite some time. So they get this really, I don't think it's quite clear in the picture, there's really bad stretch marks um, because of skin thinning. Um, um, she also looks like that, not as severely in that, in that patient, but you can see there's this um, discoloration, uneven skin tone, thinning of, this, of, of the skin and you can actually see the vessels through the skin. 
so that's also another picture of chronic skin use. You get this bad acne. Um, yeah. And just another picture of... But the question is, what are the effects of these products on the fetus? We don't really know. So there's not really much studies done around this or that I could find, but I could find a few articles where they looked at... Um, this is one of them. Uh, it's a study that was done in Dakar. I think they looked at 99 women um, um, that's... Of the 99 women that attended the ANC, I think 70% of them admitted to using skin bleaching products. Um, and um, yeah, they actually followed them through. They said there were no um, real evidence that showed that there was, that they could find specific um, side effects to the baby of these products. Probably the problem with that is we don't know what they're using. And most of the, the products that they're using are actually um, on the, it's not in the, uh, it's not uh, on the market, but it's mostly on the black market that you find it. And we don't know what the concent concentration of this, this product, of, this, of the ingredients are in. Some of them don't even have ingredients on the, on the label of them. So, we, yeah, we really don't know what the effects are. But, um, yeah, they, they're not really a lot of um, academic um, articles that I could find. Mostly, most of them were social articles. One of them, uh, in News 24, somebody said five things that you should know about skin bleaching. They talk about the, if you're going to do it, you must do it right. You need to follow a dermatologist. You must make sure you, you go for regular skin um, checks. Probably there's nothing wrong with doing it. Um, I think people have their own different reasons why they do it. Um, and then um, if, you, if, you, if you're going to buy product, make sure that it's a product that is actually, um, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Um, yeah, that is uh, <laughs> that is <laughs> validated or, yeah, it's a product that has, um, yeah, it's not one from the black market where you don't know what we, what we, what we, what's in there. So, and then um, also they talk about that there are side effects. Most people don't really care about the side effects. They are aware, but they're willing to go through it. So it's the same thing, skin cancers, um, skin thinning, poor healing, all of those. Um, also, the, another article basically also spoke about the same thing. Um, is it safe during pregnancy? Um, there's not much evidence around that. There's some article, some small studies that were done that shows that there is related to the is um, effect on the placenta. People that use skin bleaching products tend to have a smaller placenta and small for gestational age babies. But I don't think these studies are big enough to to say that that's what it is. So. Um, just some more studies that I, that I looked at, and then I also looked at um, what the treatment, as you could see, most of it is corticosteroids. So what's the effects of corticosteroids on pregnancy? So um, there was always this fear that corticosteroids cause um, congenital abnormalities, um, small for gestational age babies, preterm um, pre births, um, just to mention a few of them. But this um, Cochrane review actually, um, there was a Cochrane review in 2015 where they looked at it and there was actually no, there's no significant difference between the outcome of the babies of the mommies that were using um, corticosteroids and the ones that were not using corticosteroids. So yeah, um, thank you. Uh, that was my talk. Um, any questions from anybody? Thank you. I think I think it was a nice talk and to the point. And I hope I think if if somebody holds a gun against my head, I think I will be able to probably mention the main ones now after this talk. Um, anybody want to mention anything? Ask anything? Um, yeah. Wait, 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 wait. I have to. Thank you, Justine. It was a very nice talk. Okay. Um, I just want to find out that intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, is it really that common? Because I remember we did a 
article in special care around and they say in the UK it's quite common but yeah, it's mentioned that was actually in the UK and the US it. but I couldn't find if there's any um, yeah. in South in Africa or in Southern Africa sure. but that was actually in the UK and yeah. the US because I was like we don't see that that much so I went back and actually checked yeah I've had two patients with it in my I also had one so patient so you do see it but it's probably not <laughs> yeah, that common yeah. Yeah, then I just wanted to share something I was thinking of while the talk was going on. Um, and that was because all the diseases, it sort of says treatment, um, topical steroids and antihistamines. And then I, I, you know, then I thought, then so, you know, we all think like this thing, why don't you just give it to everybody? What is the role of a dermatologist? And I always used to think, ah, dermatologist. You know, what? you don't think dermatologists are maybe that important. So I just want to share something. So my baby had eczema, but severe eczema. Her head was bleeding. Her whole little bed was full of blood in the morning. Horrible. Scratching, scratching. Can't bath. It was all the arms. Horrible, horrible. I was crying, my baby, my baby. And then I thought, obviously, I know better than a dermatologist, of course. And I read the whole up-to-date, and I asked this friend and that friend, this pediatrician, that pediatrician, tried everything, all the different things, all the different things. And then I was sure there's no solution. It's just one of those things I have to live with it. And then my mom said, now I'm going to take it to a dermatologist. And I said to her, then, just because I don't want to upset her, I said to her, okay, fine, take it to a dermatologist. But I was 100% sure it's not going to make a difference. And then the dermatologist just gave a mixture of treatments and sort of you know, supported us in giving higher dosages more regularly, which I was too scared to do. And it was just two days and the whole problem was solved and she's never had it again. So the point I'm trying to make is I want to advocate for dermatologists and their role and yeah. that we must not treat ourselves and think we know better than other specialities. Everybody's got their place. Okay, probably something to add on to that as well. Yeah, um, yeah, you've got to say yeah. So um, I think the most important thing is to identify the, especially the ones that are um, quite um, as fetal affectation and maternal affectation, and then just to refer them timelessly, and then combined as well um, um, disciplinary treat. Uh, so refer them; they must be treated by the obstetrician and the dermatologist on time, and then follow them through through the next pregnancies as well. Um, especially those ones with ICP, we see that they have, there's a higher risk of recurrence. So I think if we know it in this pregnancy, we can make a better plan for them in the next pregnancy. Okay, enjoy your weekend. Thank you.